Are we on? Yep. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lightning Talks. For those of you who haven't been to a Lightning Talk session before, the rules are easy. Five talks enter, one talk leave. No, um, the rules are you have five minutes. You have exactly five minutes, and that is all you have. At the end of five minutes, alarms will go off and we expect people to throw things at the people on the stage, and they will get thrown off if they don't get off the stage. Um, other than that, the, the mic is open. You can talk about anything you want, as long as it's not an advert or a, a, a advertisement or job advert. Um, and uh, at which point, I will turn the floor over to Tim. Tim Ansell talking about Tim's finance. Your time starts now. Okay, um, so who was here at PyCon last year? Um, surprisingly, a lot of you haven't been. Um, so last year, there was this talk um, at the primary... Hello everyone, my name's Roger. I've had too much coffee and I'm gonna tell you about scraping websites. Okay, some sites suck. This should be about two this minutes. This one in particular. Some sites suck for your own good. So this is uh, a bank of which I'm a member and I wanted to get my bank account balance without having to press all these buttons. And they do this lovely thing where they rearrange the buttons on you every time, and it sounds like a pretty good scraping challenge to me. And basically, it drove me insane. So, this website works in a web browser. Let's use the web browser to scrape them. Enter Selenium. Everyone's heard of Selenium, right? You automate web browsers. That's what it does. It does navigation elements, runs JavaScript, takes screenshots, lots of really cool stuff, and it works in Python. So, general recipe, you get Firefox, you get Firebug, you get Selenium IDE, you get Python, you get Python Selenium, you mix it all together. Um, PyVirtual Display is optional if you don't want to actually show the browser on the screen. And you install all of that, you start up Firefox, and you start recording your session through Firefox. Save that out as a Python unit test that you can run. Uh, you can start asserting things, and from there you can really start hacking around with it and doing some fun things. So, basic recipe, record your test. That's what an example looks like. You fire up a URL, you click on some buttons, but what about that keypad? It changes every time. Not only that, the buttons are actually images. That's not good. There's no way to find out really easily what button is the two and which button is the seven, so you can press them and log in. Oop, you're frozen. Well, the network is currently not very working, um, but he, what he'll go on to say is he does some horrible things using shards of images to um, effectively screen scrape um, a login page into his bank, so then he can get his um, uh, bank details. About um, a year and a half before I saw this lightning talk, I had had the same idea, so it turns out, you know, um, fools all think alike. Um, and I started writing a pro project which uh, very vainly named Tim's Finance because I can't come up with a better name. Um, so Tim's Finance is basically a tool which is supposed to import all your um, bank transactions into a Django um, OEM database and then you can do cool things like graph them, classify them, all those type of things that accountants don't Great seem deal. to like and you I doing can't for hear some reason. Uh, so, I just wanted to um, introduce Tim's Finance again. I haven't had any time to work on it since um, about two years ago when I started. Um, so, if anybody's interested, I'm quite happy to help you with it, but I probably won't be doing more on it myself. Um, so, there's um, Tim's Finance is up on GitHub under my thing, just github.com, Mithro, Tim's Finance. Um, it turns out that um, banks are retarded. Um, instead of giving you a nice ID for a transaction that says, you know, this is the transaction, it has a unique ID, if something happens about this transaction, we'll reference it that way, um, they give you a description and a number, which don't always stay the same, stay in the same order. Um, pretty much anything you'd expect can consistent to happen, um, doesn't. So I've done the hard work of, um, oops, that's not the right one, of figuring out all the different things that can go wrong, like things going backwards in time, and um, it now is able to deal with things like 
multiple transactions with the same day, same date, same num uh, description, and those things going around. So all you have to do is give me a CSV file. Um, so if you want to help me, um, a good way to, would be to write one of these Selenium driver things and um, give me a CSV file, which I can then import. Um, I then run it through classifiers, so you just basically give it a regex and you know if it's got taxi in the description, it will decide it's a taxi fare. Um, it also does interesting things like extracts currency information from descriptions. Some of um, banks like Combank give you this thing was already in there. Um, I also link transactions and am able to deal with transfers. Thank you very much, Tim. Next up is Jacob Hazelhurst talking about permission migrations. And we have a slight grace period here to make sure all the connections actually connect up. Uh, you have the, oh. Uh, <laughs> shut up. Hang on, where'd it go? Ah, there it is. Thanks. OK. Yes. Okay, Jacob, your time starts now. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, you get, you get that time back then. <laughs> your time starts now. Uh, hi, I'm Jacob, and I work for a company called... Uh, my name, hi, my name's Jacob. Uh, I'm at hzy underscore on Twitter, and I work for a company called Gizmag. Uh, one thing that we've come into with Django over the last few months is uh, permission migrations. Uh, with, uh, at Gizmag, we have a number of uh, user groups, uh, writers, editors, administrators and developers, and uh, each user group has a different level of uh, permissions that they're able to perform things upon in our system. Uh, the system's for an online magazine, so that's how it kind of all fits together. And uh, an example of some permissions uh, is uh, our Editors Plus sort of permission group, they can uh, use the article can publish privilege uh, and then Administrators Plus have the additional privileges of uh, setting the writer of an article and setting the published at date of an article. Um, so the challenge we came up to was uh, how do we apply these permissions to groups? Uh, and uh, we had some requirements for that. They had to be usable in tests and it has to be able to evolve over time. Uh, to solve this, we came up with uh, Django Permission Migrations, which is a little package that we've pulled out of our code base. Uh, and I'll just quickly go over how we use it. Uh, so this is a, a very basic example of one of our models. And you can see that our permissions are put in like that into the meta of the model. And then uh, we have to use this uh, little block of copy-paste code uh, in the init pi of the, of the project. And what that does is every time you run syncdb, it checks if you've added more or taken away permi permissions from, uh, from the, the meta permissions there, and it will apply them to the database. And then we then have to create an app for permissions uh, and then create an initial migration. Uh, and this is the kind of structure that you'll see so we have our permissions app part of the project. Um, and then within that, we have various migrations that will apply the permissions to uh, various user groups. Uh, in the, then we go into the settings.py. And inside of that, we have the permissions app, which has to be last in the installed apps, because uh, it requires all of the permissions from the other apps to have already been created. Um, and then we have our, we declare our permission groups here. Uh, so our editor plus group contains the editors, administrators, and developers groups, while our admin plus group contains administrators and developers. Uh, and then when we go to use that inside of a migration, uh, this is an ex a basic example of one here, 
we use it just like we would a regular south migration and then we just uh, declare a list for each group uh, which permissions we'd like to apply and then just run python manage to apply migrate and that's it thanks Okay, thank you very much, Jacob. Next up is Frank Sainsbury with why acronyms are NBG. <laughs> uh, no, it's not, you're not uh, still 1280 by 1024. You're, you're 1280 by 1024, resolution. Stop running. Yeah. Uh, yes, that one. Yep. Yep. There we go. All right. Your time starts now. Frank Sainsbury speaking. Hello, everybody. Why acronyms are in BG with apologies to any Russians in the audience. I'm working on a project called, which was originally called HERA, Health Impacts Research Assessment. But my Russian friend says that's a very bad idea for a name. Arr! Right, we'll get off the wonderful pictures of Russian tanks, which was about the only sort of vaguely sort of thing, and talk about piracy. We're not into piracy. We're probably pretty reasonable most days. Um, but he's a good pirate. But like all good pirates, he's pretty poor. Very poor indeed. <laughs> Get out of it. Um, and across we go. OK, so this is the little website that we're working on where we've got 100 million bits. I think this project is significant for several reasons. One, it's attempted to use every form of technology I could get my hands on. We have got Java. We've got JavaScript. We've got PHP. We have considerable quantities of Python lurking about. Um, I mentioned JavaScript, didn't I? And anything else that goes on the web. We're running uh, MySQL databases and Postgres databases. I am trying to minimise some of those and move it all over to Postgres, but there you go. So what is HERA about? Or In fact, they've come up with a new algorithm, um, new name, which I'll have to read because I'm going blind. Community Health and Wellbeing Assessment, I think. Essentially what they want to do is they all reckon climate change is going to really seriously affect the poorest people in our community. That means they will have to organise themselves and we'll have to organise as much as we can, give them as much information so that they can adapt or plan or do something to make their life livable. It's particularly relevant uh, for poorer rural areas. Tasmania puts a hand up for that. Uh, which is, it's pretty shocking. It particularly affects us, not so much in the we're starved to death, but the farmers going broke or shooting themselves, which is pretty bad news. Um, I don't know how many of you had that happen to a friend of yours. I've had a couple. Uh, suicide is just bad news, and particularly when it's caused by a preventable economic thing. Okay, So we need to get rid of those things out of it. Uh, the particularly nasty piece of uh, work that I might have to do is with this wonderful thing, the Tayaga Data Server Portal. It takes NetCDF files, uh, reads them. Um, anyway, so that's where that is. That's That's in the data, I've deployed it onto the, the server there, and you can just browse into a file. Marvellous, although what the problem is, is of course, that uh, you have to de deconstruct that, work out how big it is, carry on, whatever, and it's going to take forever, and so let's not do that. That is poor, go back to the page. Um, right, so what we did from that was we built this thing. And that's the non-working version. But essentially that's an HTML5 um, chart with a data portion, which is an Excel spreadsheet. We've, what we did was we pulled the data out of Tager, and I can't see where I've done that. Uh, it's back there on that, that page there. Where should we say George? Um, son, George. Pulled it out and put it so that you pulled up that page, then pulled it out of the Tager server, changed, oh, and it's broken. Okay, marvellous. Poor demo, should, should do these things more carefully when we're going. And the, the, the other bit of it that we want to see is, come on, work your stupid thing. Ah, no, I did that. 
did that, did that, did that, oh, this thing. Okay, so the first effort of trying to pull out the textual data we have in Tasmania, they did 29 council studies uh, with, so we have a map which, in which we place some information, we choose a region, da 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 da, anywhere and we'll do, fire it off, it pulls out that some textual information related to it. There isn't any. Was it just, no, is it just taking forever? Uh, or has it just gone and decided to break on me just right when I didn't want it to? Maybe. Anyway, so there you go. So, is that, no, it's broken. It's broken. All right, marvellous. And so, oh, well, demonstrations are like that. I did not sacrifice a chicken anywhere. And this is what. So anyway, what we wanted to look like is this. I went to uh, GovHack 2013. We won. But these guys won a lot of prizes too. And they plotted all the Ganorki waterways. And then they had a thing so you could tag information on it. So this Django project we want to use to... And there you are. That's actually what should have been up there, a description of Granorki and how its weather's going to go. So we want to use this to join those various data sets together and get going. You're supposed to have gone 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. How the hell am I supposed to do this? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Damn, sorry. Oops, I dropped the ball there. Okay, next up is Chris Beaven. You need a yep, different Yep. Okay. Again, uh, yes. Can you do ten twenty four seven sixty eight? All right. All right. Okay, Chris, your time starts now. All right, so I've got a pretty menial topic to discuss. Uh, it's got a point at the end of it, though. So in navigation menus, uh, there are lots of these ones, like Site Tree, that um, I think it was Simon talked about earlier on in the day. So I wrote my own one, my invention, the wheel. It's the nav tag. So I, I always was frustrated that these things, probably because I, I wrote one myself back in about 2008, a navigation menu solution that used ugly classes and all of this stuff in the database. And then I was thinking, really, this is just navigation. This is just template logic. It should happen in the template layer. So I made a script that made it simple and easy. So you have a block like you're in the your side of your standard Django template and you use the nav tag and you just say nav home, it's just setting a simple variable. And then you call your super stuff which will have the actual nav which is below. So that would, that was, what's below would be what's in your main, in your base template. It's your basic navigation. You've got uh, navigation for home fruit and contact. So that's what it would look like. Um, you've specified home at the top and you can you just use this method to um, to access that. Now you can also have hierarchical trees, so you can have fruit.apples, and it'll be true for both fruit.apples and fruit, so you can have fruit highlighted and bananas highlighted, and it all works. It's just very simple. So my my end point is sometimes you just don't need to over overcomplicate the solution. You get the, all these packages that often do a lot more than you may need to do. So sometimes it takes a, it's a good idea to step back and see what you can do with a more simple solution. So this is a tag that I wrote on Django Snippets. And <laughs> yes, Simon, it should be packaged. And it was in 2009, and I don't think I've actually made any changes to it. And it's still working on sites that I write today. So yeah, you can write things that still stand the test of time. And thank you. Thank you. Here we go. Fast talk is a good talk. Okay, uh, next up is Lex Hido with Pandas and Ponies.
Right? Get on. No, you're, you're good. Oh, you're not down here? No, you, you got up on, on that display, so. Oh, okay. Uh, you want the arrangement? Oh, that's what I want, so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hello. Thank you, Lex. Your time starts now. Okay, my talk's called Pandas Loves Ponies. Uh, I'm Lexual Chocolate on Twitter and Lexual on GitHub. Um, so we all know the Django Pony, one of the best uh, mascots ever. Uh, we've got pandas. Has anyone used or know what pandas is? Oh, great. Um, pandas is like R, um, but written in Python and much better. It's kind of like in-memory SQL or in-memory uh, Excel table. It's awesome. It's built on NumPy uh, SciPy stack. And Pandas loves Pony. So how can we get these two uh, working together? Uh, pandas really do love ponies. Um, I've kind of covered most of that. So we can do uh, joins kind of like SQL from in-memory. In we can do group by. Uh, pivot tables, plotting, um, reading CSVs, reading from Excel files, reading from SQL. Uh, this is reading from a CSV file into a data frame. Again, it's just a 2D data structure. A, B, C, and D could be any column names that our data has. Uh, and then we can do all kinds of um, calculations on it. So this is, you know, means, uh, quintiles, max, min. There's all kinds of things you can do with your data. Uh, you can read it from SQL, but you can't read it from Django. Uh, yes, you can. There's the code to do it. It's two lines, um, values from a, a query set, call that to the data frame constructor, and you've got a data frame. Um, it's got a two HTML, which will output a string of HTML, so you can stick that in your templates if you would like, pass that around, uh, and that's how hard it is to write your data back out to a CSV file. Um, so I've written a, a library called Pandas Loves Ponies. Uh, it was released on Valentine's Day this year. And this is getting data from a data frame into Django. And it's that easy. Um, install my library. Um, create a data frame and then call to Django data frame. It figures out all your field names, matches up to the columns. It'll do a bulk create uh, to make it fast if you like. If you give it the update flag, it will update ones that um, match your data. Um, so it's this easy to read, say, sales data from a CSV, read it in from a CSV file, stick it into your database, the end. Um, so some useful things you could do. Um, Pandas has built-in Google Analytics. Um, that's how easy it is to pull your data out of GA into a data frame. Uh, and so that's how hard it is to put GA data into your database. Pretty easy. Uh, so the second library that I've written is called SciCatPy. Uh, it does the same thing, but for Adobe's GA, which is called, um, they keep changing the name, but it's called SciCatalyst. Um, so just to wrap up, I'm giving a talk tomorrow on salt. Unfortunately, it's the same time as Jacob's giving his talk. So, so that I don't, you can't really see that, but so I don't talk to an empty theatre, you should come see my talk on salt. It's awesome. Uh, and security is really overrated. Who needs it? <laughs> and there will be jokes. Um, finally, we're hiring at the moment. If you live in Melbourne or you know someone who has a Django, talk to me. I've got a minute left. Yes. yes but not around the time, Can I take questions on the lightning talk? No, no, all right, that's it. All right, thank you very much. 
All right, next up is Humphrey Murray. All right. And um, the author of Keeping Crispy Forms Crispier um, wrote your name, your title down, but not your name. So um, wherever you are, right, okay. Can you circle your face to the front, please? So we got you ready. I uh, don't know. Hold on. He doesn't give any choices. <laughs> yeah, at the bottom. There used to be the Linux people who got penalized and had to adjust the resolution within uh, 60 hertz. All right. All right. Okay. We're good to go. Your All time right. starts now. Um, g'day. My name's Humphrey. Um, I kind of feel a bit weird coming on before the next uh, lightning talk, but um, one thing that's kind of bugged me a fair while about Django, and it's not necessarily Django's fault, but I just never was happy with how to render forms. I didn't like just wrapping them in, you know, like um, the default way, you know, that's kind of how to, the documentation says to customise them. And it's a lot of effort, and for me it was a lot of repeating myself. So back when I was a young Django developer, like four or five years ago, I was like, yeah, I'll copy how the Django admin does it. And so I created this like field sets thing in a form and made this inheritance kind of thing, so all my forms inherited from my funky form type. And then I tried to do pretty much the same thing, but where it, it looped over like the Django admin did. And it was kind of ugly and really hard to maintain and really hard to do the bug. Um, so recently I have, um, cool, I kind of come up with this. Um, it's very simple code um, and it's, yeah, I just really like how, um, so basically it's just a uh, Django template filter called render form. Um, there's the, uh, the template to output it to and then a list of, um, list of fields to render. So that solves my problem that I don't have to I can just choose where to place my forms so I can lay out forms wherever I want. Um, and then when I started using Bootstrap and doing a bit more JavaScript, I needed more customization. So if I do a field with um, a dot class name, that just adds that class name to it. Um, and I can also, um, if I want to add an attribute to a field, I just basically do that and um, I can add those things in, which means I can um, hook into Bootstrap really easily and, other, and any other kind of thing just by changing the template for the fields that I want uh, like that. Um, so I really like that because it's just really, really simple. Uh, wrong shortcut. Um, that's pretty much the code for it. So um, it doesn't really need to be a reusable app, but I um, packaged it up like that to make it easier for myself. And you guys can have a look at the code and completely change it and um, make it um, how you done, um, however you want it. I've chucked a few templates in there, um, which, and there's some bootstrap templates. And basically that's what all the template does but it's just my way of not repeating myself. So be inspired and come up with your own way to do things like that. And if you um, are interested, uh, that's the, uh, the GitHub thing. And I, yes, I managed to get my first name as a, a username. Come on. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Hi, so my name's Danielle Maidley. Um, this is actually synergistic that um, my talk is following the last one because this is almost a thing of the same problem and afterwards I want to steal some of your ideas and we should probably solve this together. Um, so 
CRISPR keeps crispy forms crisper longer. Um, I am currently working on a very, very form-heavy app. It has more forms than any app I've ever worked on. Um, it's just pages and pages of them. And so CRISPY is a Django module, which some of you may be familiar with, to try to make forms a little more dry, as in don't repeat yourself. So a CRISPY form might look like that. Um, and that's fine. You put your stuff into rows and columns, and the little bits and pieces are your, um, your field names, and that's great. Um, except, of course, then some designer says, that's cool, but I want this. Um, with columns and um, little bits and pieces broken out and JavaScript connectors and slide out things and attachments and you name it, they want every single part of that. Um, and the designers want to be able to edit the templates. They don't want that. They don't understand how to program and every time they program, PEP8 blows up at them and says, you did it wrong. So <clears throat> I extended CRISPY to this thing I call CRISPR, which creates code that looks like this. So you go CRISPR form, where form is the name of my form variable, and this is my field. Um, and it works out what I wanted to do from CRISPR. Um, you tell CRISPR things about your forms, as in what widget to use, what attributes to use, and then you say, cool, chuck it there, and it does the right thing. And then it even does the other right thing, where um, it yells at you when you forget to put fields in, when someone extends the model and the design hasn't been updated. Um, that will start chucking warnings on the template um, that get logged to the console, and will also just start chucking in debug mode, we just start chucking fields down the bottom of the page with big red boxes around them for you to fix them. Um, what you can't obviously do yet, which is the idea I love, is use a filter to extend the attributes of the field inside the template. That's pretty gorgeous. Um, I'm stealing that. Um, the code isn't online yet because I'm too busy. Um, it will be. Until then, it's pretty straightforward. It probably doesn't even need to depend on Crispy, but it was a good starting point. Um, but it's about that long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oop. Okay. This is. <laughs> First time, how's that? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Now I've just got to. Uh, it was, but there we go. All right, so that's the lightning talks, and that is DjangoCon AU 2013, run and dusted. So thank you very much.